The Green Hornet. He hunts the biggest of all game. Public enemies who try to destroy our America. Faithful valet Cato, Britt Reed, daring young publisher, matches wits with the underworld, risking his life that criminals and racketeers within the law may feel its weight by the sting of the Green Hornet. Ride with Britt Reed in the thrilling adventure, Polarized Glasses. The Green Hornet strikes again. Lenore Case, secretary to Britt Reed, looked up as Mike Axford entered her office. Good morning, G. Casey. <laughs> oh, what on earth? Who do you think you are with those dark glasses on? A movie star in disguise, Michael? Huh. I bet they look as good on me as they would on anyone else. Don't bet too much on that. Well, what's the idea? They look like expensive ones, too. Sure, gold rim ones they are. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Casey, I found them and wore them in here just for a gag. Oh, so that's it. I wondered. Yep. Here's the case they were in. Well, let's see. Hmm, it's a nice case, too. Say, there's an address label pasted inside the cover. There's a name and address on it. Sure, I know that. Mrs. Davidson Forest, apartment 101, Bayside Terrace. Hmm. Quite a swanky address, Michael. That's it is, Casey. That big apartment house built right on the edge of the cliff along the bay. A lot of big shots live there. You'd better send those glasses over to Mrs. Forrest today. Send them, you say? <laughs> Nothing doing. I'm taking them over myself in case there's a reward. Oh, you would. Sure. And what's more, who's to say that dame Mrs. Forrest ain't a good-looking widow with a lot of dough? So that's it. <laughs> Casey, I knew you'd be jealous when I said that. <laughs> so you admit it, do you? You can't stand the thought of me maybe falling for the rich widow, so you flare up and you get mad. What's the big joke around here? All right, now, Axe, for this, Mr. Reed. <laughs> he found a pair of glasses. These. And the owner's name is inside the case. He decided she might be a widow and that she might be rich. <laughs> In which case, she'd swoon at the sight of Axford and later drag him to the altar, is that it? <laughs> oh, naturally, according to him. <laughs> oh, Casey can't take a little kid and read. I'm going to return the glasses to the lady that owns them, Mrs. Forrest. Well, Mrs. Davidson Forrest of Bayside Terrace Apartments? Yeah, that's her, all right. You know her, Reed? Well, I've heard of her. In fact, I've been invited to a reception at her place day after tomorrow. Huh. You never met her. How come you get invited? You don't get around much, do you, Michael? <laughs> She's probably invited the whole social register. Well, Mrs. Forrest is a newcomer to the city. Does a lot of entertaining. Seems to have some wealth and manages to draw a good many prominent people to her affairs. How come she gets to invite people she don't even know? Oh, a swanky address, a good social secretary... And a prominent name as honor guest will get people to her affairs. For instance, on my invitation, it says, To meet Baron de Soroka. Huh. She must be somebody to know a baron. <laughs> it might turn out that the guest of honor won't show up. Why not? Mr. Reed means there's a possibility there isn't any such person as the baron. It's just a come on to get other prominent people to attend. Huh. I'd go anyhow. Baron or no baron. <laughs> well, I'm going to drive me jalopy over there this morning and take back her glasses. See you later, Reed. If she's a rich widow, Casey, maybe I can get you an invite to the wedding. <laughs> so long. <laughs> sure, it's a swanky dump, all right. Just about noon. Maybe she'll invite me to stay and have a bit of lunch at her. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's Mike Axford, and I found something belongs to Mrs. Forrest. What's more, I ain't giving it to anyone else. So go tell her I'm here. 
Please step inside, sir. That I will. I shall inform Mrs. Forrest that you're here, Mr. Axford. Okay, I'll wait. Very good, sir. Hmm. Them kind of guys always give me the willies. Can't tell whether they're smiling or sneering at a guy the way they look you over. Yeah. What a joint. Mrs. Forrest will see you, sir. Walk this way, please. Right in here. Mr. Axford, madame. Oh, good morning, Mr. Axford. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, you may go, Charles. Very good, madame. <laughs> I guess he thought he was going to get an earful. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> oh, uh, in the movies, you know, butlers are always listening to doors and the likes of that. Oh, <laughs> you've come on a confidential matter, perhaps? No, uh, I came because I found a pair of glasses belonging to you, ma'am. Uh, I got him here. Oh, Oh, yes, my polarized glasses. How nice of you to bring them back to me, Mr. Axford. <laughs> it was the only honest thing to do, ma'am. Here they are. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sure you wouldn't think of taking a reward, so I won't embarrass you by offering one. Oh, uh, you won't? Well, <laughs> and now that I think of it, I guess I wouldn't think of it. That is... Um... <laughs> Oh, great. You really have a very charming sense of humor, Mr. Axford. I, uh, have? <laughs> yeah, that, that's right, I have. <laughs> My husband had no sense of humor whatsoever, poor thing. He was dreadfully boring. Are, um, you a widow by any chance, ma'am? Yes, I am. I'm afraid I'm getting the reputation of being a very gay widow, too. Oh. <laughs> I know you were a widow. I was right. <laughs> you knew? <laughs> I don't understand. Oh, no matter. Uh, hey, now. It's a fine place you got here. What's that out there? A balcony overlooking the water? Oh, that's the terrace. Come see the view I have of the bay. Sure. Glad to. Hey, no, you sure do have a view of that. Will you look at that swell-looking boat out there? Oh, that's Baron de Soroka's yacht. This is really no. You know, I heard somebody say that Baron stuff was a fake. You... I see. Uh, may I ask who it was who told you that? Well, no, as, as we newspaper men say, it was said off the record, ma'am, so I, I won't mention names. You're a newspaper man? Oh, sure. Reporter on the Daily Sentinel. <laughs> and if I do say so myself, a darn good one is that. <laughs> really? Yep. When Mike Axford goes out to get a story, he gets it one way or another. You can bet on that. Well, I, I'm glad to know that. I'll... By the way, how would you like to meet the Baron, Mr. Axford? You mean I'm invited to your party day after tomorrow? Well, yes, yes, of course. But uh, the other guests are coming at nine o'clock. I'd like you to come earlier. Say at eight. Then you and the Baron can become acquainted. Say no, that'll really be something that it will. <laughs> the others will have a fit when they hear I'm going to get a chance to have a long talk with the Baron. Well, <laughs> if you really hope to get a story, why not keep it a secret about your coming here ahead of time? Otherwise, some other reporter may try to get to the Baron before you do. Say, that's a good idea. I'll keep quiet about it and surprise all of them. Thanks for inviting me, ma'am. Oh, not at all. Uh, shall we go inside now? Okay. I'll see you to the door, Mr. Exit. Sure, sure. Time I was getting back anyhow. Well, uh, let me thank you again for bringing my glasses to me. Oh, that's okay, Mrs. Forrest. Your hat, sir. Uh, huh? Oh, it's you. <laughs> you must have popped up from under the table. <laughs> the table, sir? Sure, the table there that my hat was on. <laughs> I take it. Thanks. Well, good day, Mr. Axford. I'll be looking forward to seeing you the night of the reception. I'll be here with bells on, ma'am. That I will. So long. Charlie, that man's dangerous. We'll have to take a message out to the yacht tonight. We have plans to make. That guy's too smart for his own good. He'll be sorry he stuck his nose into our business when Paul gets through with him. You can bet on that. <laughs>
It was a few minutes before eight on the night of the forest reception. Mrs. Forrest was in the living room of her apartment in earnest conversation with the butler and with a tall, dark-haired man in evening clothes whose close-cropped Van Dyke beard and small mustache gave him a distinguished and foreign appearance. It's almost eight o'clock, Paul. He'll soon be here. Are you sure you'll come alone, Lily? Oh, if he doesn't, it'll spoil everything. I tell you, both be on guard. That man expert is dangerous. Charlie says he was smart enough to play the dope when he came here. Yeah, that's right. To look at him and talk to him, you'd think he was really dumb. But he was suspicious of Charlie right away. And he hinted that he knew the Baron was a fake. Yeah, and he knew Lily was a widow. Then he made an excuse to get out on the terrace and mention the yacht. Do you think he's working alone, Lily? No, I don't. So you'll have to be careful. He said he was told the Baron was a fake. Well, I thought he was a government man at first, and then he said he was a reporter. You checked that, of course. Yes, there is a reporter named Axford on the Daily Sentinel. Huh. Made quite a point of seeing me personally to hand me my polarized glasses, too. Charlie and I'll see that he's taken care of. You'll have to play your part as the Baron very carefully until you get him on the terrace. Yeah, he's heavy set. Looks like he might put up a good fight. We'll have to move in on him easy. We will, don't worry. My role as the Baron is my biggest gamble yet. But my forged credentials are perfect. I have the backing of a certain government. My disguise has proven itself. I'm not going to let that snooping reporter crab everything right at the climax of our act. Oh, he's at the door. Go let him in, Charlie. Okay. I'll stay only a minute, and then I'll suggest you two go on the terrace for cocktails. That'll give you your chance. Right. Now, for the switch to the Baron's accent. Mr. Michael Axford. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Forrest. Mr. Axford. Oh, you're right on time. Baron de Soroka, may I present Mr. Axford? Delighted, my dear Mr. Axford. Uh, glad to meet you, Baron. I'll leave you two gentlemen alone so that you can get acquainted. I have so much to do before the other guests arrive. You're most thoughtful, Madame Forrest. Uh, go right ahead, ma'am. Don't let us keep you. I suggest you go out on the terrace. I'll have Charles bring cocktails. Suits me. Eh, Baron? <laughs> Let's go. Of course. Uh, Golly. Sure, it is a nice moonlight night. Ain't it, Baron? Yes, of course. It reminds me so much of the moonlight on the waters of the Danube and old Vienna. Look. Far over there. Ah, such beauty. Yeah. By the way, I want to ask you... Good work, Charlie. Now we'll take this guy where he won't do any snooping for a long, long time. We'll continue our Green Hornet adventure in just a moment. Almost an hour had passed since Mike Axford had met with foul play in Mrs. Forrest's apartment. Britt Reed, with his faithful bonnet Cato at the wheel, was driving along in his smart club coupe on the way to the forest reception. The road ran straight down to the bay. The bayside terrace apartments was outlined to the left. Directly in Britt's line of vision were the moonlit waters of the bay and the lights of the boats at Anchorage. The view of water and boats much better when seen through a polarized glass of windshield, Mr. Britt. Yes. Polarized windshields should be made standard equipment on all cars, Cato. I often think... Well, that's strange. Well, what do you think strange? Now, look. See the outline of that yacht out in the bay? Well, yes, sir. Notice the light on it? Oh, it seemed to flash off and on. Well, that's it. It flickers as though someone were sending signals. Was that true? Now, stop for a moment, Cato. We're watching. See? One, two, three. Pause, one. Now there's two very quick ones. Well, there are one, two, pause, one. And two more quick ones. There's no doubt those are signals of some kind, Cato. With not more so international code. I know. The two quick ones seem to indicate the end of a word or, or perhaps a letter. Oh, let's go down, Cato. Yes, sir. It won't do any harm for us to phone police headquarters and have them investigate. Well, that best. If there's nothing wrong, there's no harm done by calling police. Well, that's right. Well, say, uh, did Axford come home tonight? He left the office early. Oh, yes, sir. Well, he come in with dinner suit. <laughs> it not fit very well. It quite tight. <laughs> he take your black pearl studs to wear. I hope he doesn't lose one of them. I wonder where he's going. Well, he not say, Mr. Britt. 
Well, here at Bayside Terrace. I'm not going to stay long, kiddo. You might as well wait for me. I wait. I'll see you later. Good evening, Mr. Reed. Well, it's Sergeant Burke. What are you doing around here? Something wrong? No, nothing like that. I just drove over with a couple of the boys. This is a big affair, and the cars get pretty well jammed up unless we keep them moving. Oh, I see. Oh, by the way, I was going to call headquarters, so I'm glad I ran into you. Uh, there's something I want you to see. Uh, step out here to the curb where you can see the bay, will you? Sure. What do you want me to look at? Well, out there on that yacht. Notice the light? It flickers regularly as though signaling. Well, yeah, I'm looking at it, but it ain't flickered yet, Mr. Reed. That's right. Well, I'll run along to the reception. If you find out anything about that light, let me know. That I will, Mr. Reed. See you later. Okay, Sergeant. I'll talk to you when I come out. I won't be long. Mrs. Davidson Forrest's reception was in full swing. Diplomats, political figures, officials of state, and service officers intermingled with the city's social set. Britt Reed stood talking to one of his many acquaintances. Did you meet the Baron, Britt? Yes, for just a moment. I understand his yacht is anchored right out there in the bay. Really? I noticed the yacht a while ago as I drove here. I didn't know whose it was. Yeah, that's a nice way to travel. Yes, very. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I think I'll stroll out on the terrace and look at it. Sure, go ahead. Let us know, Brad. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Forrest, <laughs> admiring the view? Oh. I'm oh, sorry. I, I didn't mean to start. Oh, that's perfectly all right. Mr. Reed. Oh, Ridley. oh, yes, of course. I should have remembered. But with so many, you know. I understand. I, uh, I've been noticing your dark glasses. Isn't it difficult out oh, here? Oh, see... these. I, I like to look at the light through them. You see, these are polarized lenses. They dispense with the glare. Oh, of course, I should have known. Well, I, <laughs> I stepped on something that felt like a bead. Probably just a pebble. Sometimes the wind blows a few onto the terrace. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll go back to my guest. Yes, of course. I'll have a look at whatever it was I stepped on. Light my lighter. Looks like... Hmm. Black pearl stud. Real pearl, too. It would have been crushed under my foot. These aren't too common. Well, this one is mine. I can tell from the setting. Hmm. Have a look around. Axford must be here someplace. <laughs> he must have crashed the gate. <laughs> A short time later, Rick Reed left the apartment house. He learned from Sergeant Burke that the light had not flickered and that Axford had not been seen going to the party. After returning to his own apartment, Reed sat in deep thought, holding the pearl stud in his hand. Then Cato spoke. What you think of Mr. Britt? This is one of my very own studs that Axford was wearing tonight. Yet Burke says he didn't go into the reception. Yet you find stud on terrace of Mrs. Forrest's apartment? That's right. Then I keep thinking of those signal flashes. Or at least that's what we thought they were. Burke says the light has been steady ever since I told him about it. Oh, yes, that's true. I watch also through a back window of car, but light stays steady. Another thing that I've been thinking of is Mrs. Forrest standing on the terrace away from her guests looking at the view, which you can see any time. She has polarized glasses just for the purpose of looking at... Wait a minute. What matter? I just thought of something. We're going back down there, Keto. We'll check things once more. But this time, we'll take the Black Beauty just in case. Come on. We on road that go down to Bayside Terrace, we're not seeing any cars. we party all over, perhaps. Yes, Keto, it's late. Right. Look. That light's flickering again, Cato. Well, that right. Stop in the shadows and we'll watch it again. I'll get out a pencil and a bit of paper. We'll keep track of those flashes and try to figure out the code. For some time.
time, Britt and Cato sat watching the light, jotting down the number of flashes. Suddenly, Britt spoke. Cato, I think I've hit the code. The flashes before the short pauses seem always to run numerically from two to nine. None over and no ones. Well, that's right. The flashes after the pauses run only from one to three. I'm convinced they're using the telephone dial as a code. There are three letters in each circle from two to nine. So that flashing, well, let's say two, pause one, that could be the letter A and so on. Well, that code, all right. Okay. Then let's put together what we've written down and see what they were saying with that light. What'd you get, Mr. Britt? Listen. Drop roll from wire recorder on line to ledge below terrace. We'll send for. And this says, give warning if reporter trace there. Would that be in Oxford, perhaps? I think so. And these messages were directed to that woman's apartment. I don't see how... Wait a minute. Cato, lean out here and look at that light. Uh, yes, sir. The light not flicker now. Now look through the polarized windshield. Well, now it flicker, Mr. Britt. That's it, Cato. Axford must have found out something. He went to that party and something happened. He's in danger on that yacht. I'm sure of it. Get going, Cato. We have work to do and fast. A short time later at police headquarters... Uh, funny... Funny how good Reed thought he saw signal flashes coming from the light on the Baron's shot, Cassidy. Yeah, guess that guy needs glasses, Sarge. Well, I don't know. But I sure couldn't see anything wrong with that light. It was as steady as... Glory be, what's that? A bomb! Somebody threw it in the window! Ah, uh, that ain't any bomb. It's a stone. Something tied to it. Let's see what it is. It's a printed note. Read it, Sarge! Well, give me a chance. Give me a chance. That Baron's a fake and his yacht's a spice nest. Raid that yacht and you'll save the life of a reporter named Axford. Then go to the forest dame's apartment for the rest of the gang. Great day. Let's check on this. Get the harbor police on the phone. We got work to do. Mike Axford's mixed up with spies. We find roll of recorded wire, Mr. Britt, on ledge below terrace. Now what we do? We'll wait here just outside until we hear a commotion from the yacht. Then we'll go inside. Well, maybe police come here before we get it. Now go the harbor police to the yacht. The men on yacht shoot at police. Yes. Well, that's our cue for some action. Later in Mrs. Forrest's apartment. Charlie! Charlie! What's going on out there? The police must be raiding the yacht. we better get out of here in a hurry. What's the rush, Sandy? You're not going anyplace. Oh. The Green Hornet. You're not short, Hornet. Oh. What's going, fella? Oh, that, that roll of wire. Where'd you get that? Stop worrying, lady. This will help you to do it. No. Oh. The police will soon come. We'll leave them here with that roll of recorded wire and her polarized glasses as evidence. Let's get out of here. Later in Britt Reed's apartment, soon after Sergeant Burke brought Axford home... Wasn't that some story we got, Reed? Yes, it was, Axford. I still don't get it how polarized glass works. Polarized glass? Yeah, that's how the spies worked. They used polarized glass in front of the searchlight. Oh, so that's it. Well, how's it work? Well, polarized glass breaks a light beam into a very thin beam. And like in Venetian blinds. Well, something of that sort. It's used to cut down glare and reflection. I have it in my car's windshield. Now... If two pieces of polarized glass are held together in a certain way, they cut off the light. If I look through my polarized windshield at the headlight of a car, and that headlight has a lens of polarized glass set in the right way, I won't see the light at all. That's it. Mrs. Forrest had glasses like your windshield. Those guys on the boat held polarized glass over the light, and it was cut off from Mrs. Forrest. And for me, when I saw it through the windshield of my car. Yeah, and people seeing the light without looking through that trick glass didn't notice any change. That's how those lugs could send signals no one but the dame could see. They made dots and dashes by covering and uncovering the searchlight with the polarized glass. 
And she saw those dots and dashes because she had on polarized glasses. That's it. Reed, there's more to tell you. That baron was a fake. He was just to come on to get important officials to Mrs. Farr's party. Then when they were talking confidential, she'd give the butler a signal and he'd start the wire recorder going. Microphones were hit all over the place. They got important bits of news for the foreign power that paid them. Amazing. Sergeant, you did a swell job of breaking that case. How you did it is hard for me to say. Huh. Ain't hard for me to say. It was a tip-off by somebody that did it. I'll bet it was the Green Hornet. Because when we found them spies, there was a Green Hornet seal on the wire recorder. And to think the whole thing started over me finding them polarized glasses. Ain't it amazing? <laughs> Popular radio dramas created by George W. Trendle are a copyrighted feature of The Green Hornet, Incorporated. All characters, names, places, and incidents used are 